doing time. I, I don't know about you, but I'm going to miss the mischievous little girl with the milk. I am. Yeah, yeah. The idea behind the series was actually to introduce us to some concepts and some behaviors that we can employ in our own personal lives that will help us experience richer, fuller lives. Rather than feeling like each and every day I'm just going through the motions, get up, do the same old thing, go to bed, get up the next day, do it all over again. God did not design us for that. God designed us to experience rich, full lives. But see, the problem is most of us allow the wrong values to drive our behavior. We do things our way. We do things the world's way instead of God's way. And the result is we're just doing time. We feel like life is empty. Well, maybe we need to change some of our values that drive our behavior. So what we did was we took some foundational teaching from God's Word, and we extracted from those, well, six things that we believe if, if we actually embrace them and do them is going to raise our quality of life. It's going to raise the quality of life of the people in our circles of influence. I believe it could raise the quality of life and make an actual no kidding difference right here in the community that we serve in. Week one, we, we talked about battling mediocrity. And, and all that really means is doing what God said. Do everything as if you're doing it for the Lord, right? If I'm doing something for Jesus, man, I'm going to give it my best shot. What if we attacked everything we did in life with that kind of an attitude? If we did, what you and I engage in would turn out really, really good. Have you ever, have you ever like, like maybe you, you mow your lawn, right? And I don't know about you, but I would take my time to do that. And do it well. And then break out the weed eater and go around and edge everything. And then you break out the, the blower thing. And, you, and after you're done, did you ever go across the street and just look at what I've done that? And it's like, wow, that looks good. I rob myself of that experience if I just do a half-baked job on the lawn. What if we did everything with excellence? Would not that raise our satisfaction level of pretty much everything we do. We also talked about, we, we, we are supposed to make things happen. That sermon that I got to teach on, I, I wanted to give us a mindset that each and every one of us, we were placed here for a reason. Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans I have for you. You've got Ephesians 2 and verse 10 where it talks about you are a work of art. You're a masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do Good works that God planned in advance. Every single human being was born with a purpose. And if we are not engaging in the purpose, if we're not trying to make it happen, guess what? There's something in life that you are designed to do that's not happening. And what we do is we sit around, we look around, we go, man, something ought to be done about, about that. Something ought to be done about, I wish somebody, maybe we're supposed to be the somebody to make something happen. We went from there, I got to teach on Pursue Health, and to me, this is the biggest no-brainer of the entire six-week series. Healthy people lead fuller lives. When we intentionally pour into our own lives to make sure that we are emotionally healthy, that our relationships are healthy, we have a healthy relationship with our God so we're spiritually healthy, we actually engage in physical activity and eat well so that we are physically healthy. If all of those things are healthy, does it not make sense? We're going to have a little richer, a little fuller life because of it. Then the following week, Pastor Ben, chose, uh, chose, he, he taught on what I believe is the most not so intuitive and no-brainer concept called choose trust. Choose trust. If you've been around this world for more than a minute, there has been someone somewhere that has taken advantage of you, that has done you wrong. And that happens often enough, and we can become cynical, and we live in a very cynical world. But we are supposed to be different as followers of Jesus. We can choose to think the best 
about people. We can choose to be the best person and expect that in return. So if we choose to trust rather than be cynical, don't you wake up each day with maybe a little rosier look on life instead of expecting to be hurt or taken advantage of? And then finally last week, we, we talked about taking the low place. And that was a call to service. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, which means we follow what he did, we learn from him and try and, and do things he did. You know, he told us very clearly, I came to serve, not to be served. And that is so counterintuitive and countercultural because the world says, hey, take care of number one. Let others serve you. That's what's going to make you happy. But the reality is, when we do something good, to make someone else's life a little bit better. We are the ones that get blessed and live richer, fuller lives. I'm glad you're with me, Ralph. Amen. Amen. All right, so I am going to get into our sixth and final topic. Be before I do, like, I'm, I'm just really excited. And, and, and I thought, well, I thought I should just recognize, man, it is Olympic time. The 2018 Winter Olympics are happening right now. And there's some exciting things going on there. So, so I, I wanted to ask, so favorite events. What's your favorite event? Luge, figure skating. Luge, figure skating. <laughs> so, Bill, thank you for that segue. Honest to goodness, I'd rather watch paint dry. Then watch curling, all right? I, I have no idea why these guys take those little brooms in front of the slidey thing. And the slidey thing probably has a name. That's how much I care about this sport. I, can't, I don't even believe they call it a sport. It freaks me out they call those guys athletes. You need no athletic ability whatsoever. You may need some skill. And could you wear those pants on international TV? Curling, really? Speed sports, that's where the excitement is. And sometimes the difference between a medal and watching someone else get a medal is hundreds or maybe thousands of a second. Those who win medals, and, and this is what launches us into our topic today, they typically do one thing better on that particular day than their competitors did. And it can be summed up in the word alignment. See, the one who keeps their skis perfectly aligned as they're going down that hill at 80 miles an hour. You talk about crazy people. Those are crazy people. 80 miles an hour on a couple pieces of wood. But the ones who stay perfectly aligned with those skis are typically the ones to win. The one whose ski wavers just a bit, catches an edge instead of running smoothly on the snow. It costs you maybe that hundredth or that thousandth of a second. That means the difference between standing on the podium or watching somebody else stand on the podium. For those of us who are not pros, I used to ski a lot in younger days, not, not so much anymore. But I want you to just think about it for a minute. What happens when your skis get out of alignment? What, what happens when they get so far out of alignment that the tips cross and you're doing about 20 miles an hour? Oh, yeah. It's cool. There's tumbling. There's a snow explosion. And probably one of your friends catches it on camera and shares it on Snapchat. I would, I would reconsider my friendship with that person, but that's probably what happens. Build alignment. That is, that is our topic for this week and the concept we're going to tackle today. And we're going to view this from more of a corporate standpoint than an individual standpoint, although it's the individuals who need to be aligned in order for the organization to move forward. And the church is an organization. It truly is. Whether you're a Fortune 500 company or a church, you have mission, vision, values, right? There is a mission that God has placed this church right here in Lakewood to accomplish. 
And if the people in the church aren't fully aligned in achieving that mission, well, we're not going to do it well. Because you know what happens when you're in an organization and everybody has their own agenda and everybody goes their, same, their, their own direction. The reality is that this organization doesn't move where it's supposed to because alignment determines direction and destination. If the entirety of the organization, Fortune 500 company church, if each and every one of us have the same tunnel vision laser focus on where we're going and what God has for us to accomplish, well, we're going to go the right direction and we're going to arrive at the right destination. So something our elder board asks, we talk about it as a staff. We ask, you know, if someone asked one of our members, someone who's been around, you know, more than a minute or two, what's the mission of your church? If someone came up to you who doesn't know anything about the church and said, hey, what's your, what's your mission? We ask ourselves, would our people, by and large, would they know? Would they be able to answer that question? Would they just naturally, without hesitation, say, yeah, our church exists to love people to life? That's our, our church exists to love people to life. Some of you may, and, and very understandably, go to, well, we, we love God, love others, create followers. Because that's been on the wall for a long time, and that is true. All right? It's true. But that's the big C church. That's the global church goal. Every church is responsible for helping people love God, love others, and create followers. It comes from the Great Commandment, Great Commission. Our unique expression of the mission of the church is that we exist to love people to life. Would our people be able to articulate that? Would, would our people be able to take it a step further and actually explain that? You know, we believe we exist as a church to help people live fuller, richer lives right now. And we exist as a church to love people in such a way that we would help them find and follow Jesus, which leads to that eternal life. I, I hope so. I hope that each and every person in the church would be able to articulate that, that that's what we're about, that's why we exist, that's why we do what we do. And if not then what it tells us as a leadership is that we need to do a better job of communicating exactly what it is that God has placed this church here to do and what our role is inside of it in order to get to the destination God desires. So you might ask the question, why is it so important that the entire church knows the mission and the vision? I mean... Does it really matter? And I think that's a fair question. Does it really matter if I know the mission and the vision as long as I'm doing what the church does? I mean, we come to church. We worship together. We learn. We pray. We do some incredibly cool things in this community. Our, com our community knows us and they love us. What we do to make this community better. We invest and helping people find and follow Jesus in places like Argentina and Estonia and Ecuador and Thailand. Isn't that enough? What difference does it make if we're all aligned on this vision? I mean, isn't that what the early church did? They met together, they worshiped, they studied, they prayed, they did stuff like that. It is. And I believe if we study the passage that tells us what the early church looked like, It'll give us an opportunity to understand the why behind what they were doing. So I'm going to invite you, if you have your own paper Bibles, Acts chapter 2 at verse 42. Electronic Bible, feel free to go there. Or just be lame, lazy dudes and watch the, the scriptures pop up on the screen. Acts 2 at verse 42. What happens just prior to this is... Jesus had been resurrected 40 days prior. And then the Holy Spirit of God came upon the followers of Jesus Christ and empowered them. Empowered them in such a way that they were emboldened 
to go out into the streets, the very streets where the Jews who killed Jesus were waiting to find them so that maybe they could do the same thing, to go out into the streets and preach Jesus. It's said that Peter's message was so powerful on that day that 3,000 people made decisions for Christ on that one day. And that 3,000 people joined with the others, and they became a Christian community. And, and at verse 42 and following, it tells us how that community did life together. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the sharing of meals, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions, shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So I want to take a look at some major elements captured by this passage. And I want us to look at them and then maybe look at us. Are we a picture of that early church? Does our community do life the way the first church communities did life? First thing that stands out to me is that they were devoted to learning. And I need you to think about this for a moment. These, <laughs> these were all brand new baby Christians. They are likely all Jews. They are in Jerusalem. These are people who suddenly the light went on and they realized Jesus was the one, the Messiah. See, they had learned about the Messiah their whole lives, and they were expecting something very different, that conquering king, that warrior that's going to deliver them from Roman oppression. But what they got was something very, very different from what they anticipated. But they knew, they knew in their hearts, they knew from the power of the Spirit, from the message of the apostles, he was the one. And so now they had a passion to learn about him. Now, see, they didn't have the gift that you and I have today. We have the Word of God in written form that we can take and read and study. They had the apostles. Dude, I'd love to have one of them. But yeah, because like they were like there. They walked with Jesus for years, and so these people sat at the feet of the apostles so they could hear the stories that these guys experienced firsthand, the lessons that Jesus taught to the masses these guys are now teaching to those brand new baby Christian believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, met together in one place, worshiped together in a temple. You can call this a temple if you want. The house of God, what was good for the first Christians over 2,000 years ago is still good for us today. We meet together here. We worship. We learn from God's word. And so two words that are important, I believe, to focus on, alignment and devotion. So if you were to go back and reread the very first verse, verse of the passage, all the believers devoted themselves to the teaching. All the believers, every single person was completely and utterly aligned toward that one goal. We need to learn about the Lord. The entire Christian community came together with the same purpose. They were headed in the same direction, growing deeper in their relationships with one another, growing deeper in their relationship with God because they wanted to learn everything they could possibly learn about the man, the God who gave his life to save theirs. Devotion, 
Second word. Speaks to their commitment. They met together daily to study God's word. They met in the temple. They met in homes. What that communicates is the number one priority in their lives is God. And it was shown by how they lived, not just by words coming out of their mouths. They were devoted to learning, aligned as a community, going the same direction, headed towards the same destination. Second thing that was important to me as I read this passage is they were devoted to one another. All the believers, these are some excerpts from that entire passage. All the believers devoted themselves to the fellowship. Now, that may be a word that many of us don't understand today. You're the fellowship. We are are the fellowship. You could replace the word family. We call ourselves a church family. The body of believers, the fellowship, the community of Christians. They devoted themselves to the fellowship, to sharing in meals. I like that part a lot. Our Wednesday life group, we do dinner every week. They shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared money with those in need. We are a church family, and this is one of the reasons why, because we model ourselves after the community that was exhibited by the first church. See, families, they take care of one another. Families share the joys, new babies, whatever it is, someone graduating from college, we share those things together, and we walk with each other through tragedy. That's what families do. We share everything we have so everyone in the family, well, so their needs can be taken care of. That's what family does. And this is so countercultural because the world's values don't tell us to take care of one another. The world's values say take care of, of, of yourself and then maybe if there's something left over, you might help somebody. The fellowship, this church that we study about today is a picture of radical generosity. And we try very hard as a church to follow that. It's why we advocate a value of sacrifice and gratitude. We often say when it comes to finances as a church community that we love to give first, give freely, and give fearlessly. Last year alone, You, as Faith Mountain, gave away over $45,000 to worthy causes outside of the church. Those things in the community that the community knows us for, we invested in them financially. Those things that happen in those countries where we have missionaries, we invested in them financially, $45,000. And if you were here for the last year, you know well that it was not Well, it was not a year where we had much excess. In fact, it was a very challenging financial year. And yet we promised that we were going to give freely, give first, give fearlessly. And we as a leadership chose not to back away from generosity. Is it irrational? Yep. But it's God's way and God's economy. Now, we as a church are only able to give to those things in a sacrificial way because so many individuals in the church are aligned with that vision of practicing irrational generosity. It's only because the people here give that we're able to give and invest God's wealth in the things that have his heart. We invest in ministries here that invest in this community We invest in ministries here that help our kids to find and follow Jesus, our students, our adults. I was blessed to teach not long ago on the the whole concept of generosity, and one of my favorite passages on the topic comes out of 2 Corinthians 9. It says, he, God, will make you rich in every way so that, so that's your important. Anytime you see a so that in the Bible, there's something God wants you to do with what you just read. So, God gives 
May, will make you rich in every way so that you can always give freely. One of our values, give freely. And my interpretation of that, my takeaway on that is that God gives generously to those who give generously so they can give generously. You guys are on it, man. And that, isn't that just so counterintuitive that God gives more if we give more? God gives more when we give more because he wants us to give more. The early church was generous. They gave to one another. They sold property. They sold possessions. They put that together in a pool, and they, well, they gave to each one as they had need, and that way nobody, nobody needed. If we all align ourselves around that concept of sacrifice and irrational generosity, will not our lives be better? And those around us, won't their lives be better? They're tangible ways that we live out our mission. So the final observation that I'm going to share this morning as we study about the early church and how they devoted themselves to, to one another. Well, finally, I, I, I believe the most important teaching there is that they devoted themselves to God. If you go back and read the base passage again, it says they devoted themselves to prayer. And, and what is prayer but a conversation with your God? What is prayer but a way to cultivate and build your relationship with God? They took the time to talk. They took the time to listen. They intentionally poured into that personal relationship with the Lord. It says they devoted themselves to worship. Again, growing and cultivating that relationship. It says they had a deep sense of awe at the miracles, the signs and wonders. The apostles may have performed them, but they performed them because of the power of God. They couldn't have done that on their own. They worshiped together in the large gathering. They worshiped together in small groups, in homes. See, they were completely aligned in the single most important things, that we are to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. One of the major elements of worship in the early church was communion. It says right in that passage, they got together and they celebrated the Lord's Supper together. And rather than explain it, rather than teach it, we're going to do it. See, if there's one thing that Christians must be aligned on, it's with the reality, the absolute no kidding fact that Jesus was real. He was God in the flesh. He willingly sacrificed himself on a cross to pay the penalty for the sins of humanity of which you and I are a part. He went to the grave. And then he rose from the dead, conquering death and paying the penalty for sin. The practice of communion is a constant reminder of those facts. I do want to stress as we come to the Lord's table that this is something the believers did together. And while we practice open communion here at this church, meaning you don't need to be a member of this church, but you do need to be a believer. And we don't do that to be exclusive. It's, it's, it's not to be hurtful of anyone who hasn't yet made that decision to be a Jesus follower. But the reality is it wouldn't mean anything to you yet. We have stations in the front. Stations in the back. If you are a gluten-free kind of person, we have gluten-free crackers right here to, to meet that need. One of Jesus' instructions to the church was do this in remembrance of me. Do this to remember what I did for you. So to prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper, each of us should spend a few moments 
in reflection on that fact and in prayer. We should reflect maybe on our own behaviors over this last week or month or whatever it may be. And there are probably some things that each of us wish we could have done differently. Remember, the sacrifice on the cross gave forgiveness for our behaviors. So realize he forgave you before you even committed the sin. It's good to take some time to remember that. His death gave us the opportunity for life, but only if you embrace him as Lord and Savior. A life free from the penalty of sin and an eternal life forever with him. After your time of reflection, I encourage you to just go to one of the stations, get the elements, take them back to your seat, and then I'd like to guide us together, completely aligned in this act of worship to our God. And we'll, we'll take them together when everyone is ready. So one of the churches that Paul started was a church in Corinth. And he wanted to teach the people of the church about this, this incredible sacrament we call communion. So I'm going to read to you how he taught them out of the book of 1 Corinthians. And this comes from Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible called The Message. Paul says, let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it's so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took the bread, Having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink the cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. It is good to remember that sacrifice, whether you've been a follower of Christ for Five minutes or 50 years. Amen. It truly is an act of worship. It reminds us how much he gave for us. And the expectation that we should give for others. So I'm going to wrap up today's topic and this series in this way. Our study of Acts 2 showed the actions of the early church. This is how they practiced community and how they did life together. But what about the original question? I led into this by saying, but why does it matter if we're aligned towards this one vision? Why did they meet together and worship and learn and pray and sacrifice and practice generosity? Why? Isn't it enough just to do? Well, it's because they were aligned around a purpose and a mission that you find in the very last verse of that passage. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Imagine that as they loved God. They loved one another. They loved people outside of their fellowship, outside of their church family. They shared with others what they were learning about Jesus. They invited them into their family so that they could hear from the very men who walked with Christ who this man was and what he did. Their single tunnel vision, laser-focused mission was to help people find and follow Jesus. 
We exist to love people to life. It says, it says, he added to their number daily those who are being saved. We believe God desires a full life for us and for every single human being he ever created. And if we say that we exist to love people to life, the most loving thing we will ever do is help them find and follow Jesus, which helps, which helps them to find eternal life. In each of the previous weeks, we actually started our, our topic with a question. This week, I chose to end the series with the question. Am I advancing our mission and vision? It's a question for each one of us to wrestle with. Am I advancing the mission and vision? Am I willing to love people to life by helping them find and follow Jesus? Am I contributing to that mission in any way? Am I aligned? Am I going the same direction that God called the church to go? I want you to think in your head, you're asking yourself these questions. Am I devoted to learning? Is the Sunday gathering where we dive into God's word together a priority in my life? Is the Bible, the gift that I have in my hands, so precious that I actually spend time in it every day? Am I part of a life group where smaller gatherings of people get together to study God's word and build the relationships with one another? Am I devoted to the fellowship? Am I devoted to the people of this family? Do I practice irrational generosity? Do I invest any of my time and talents in the members of this family that I am now a part? Finally, am I devoted to God? Can I actually say He is my first love? Do I pray? Do I listen for his response? Do I read about him in his word? Is worship a daily priority and not just an hour on Sunday morning? If you said no to any of those questions, well, then you know exactly where to focus your attention to just intentionally pour into those areas where you weren't able to say yes. I would also encourage you, all of those places where you were able to say, yes, Lord, I do that. Yes, Lord, I am that. Would you celebrate that? Man, you're at a place in your spiritual journey that's a great place to be. And the whole idea is just to take the next step. Nobody here is perfect. And we have a God that's about progress, not perfection. So take the next step in the journey. Don't beat yourself up that you're not Oh, all of those things. Identify the next place that God wants you to grow spiritually. Let me end here. Just by, as I was writing this and gathering some data, it was, it was a little enlightening to me. A little over 50% of our family serve in ministry. That may be where some of us need to realign. or less of us who call the church, this church our home, support it financially. The average church attender attends Sunday worship about 50% of the time, 26 out of 52 weeks a year. About 50% of our church family are in a smaller, smaller gathering that we call a life group. When I saw all of those 50% statistics, it excited me. I know, you think it would have, like, aggravated me, but it didn't. It excited me because I see the potential. What if 100% of us were in life groups, were irrationally generous, attended more than 26 times a year? What if 100% of us engaged in this, 
Could you imagine giving away 90 or 100,000 or 150,000 dollars a year to causes that God's heart bleeds for? What kind of impact could we make in the community? If 100% of our people were engaged in serving someone somewhere in ministry, what might be? What might be? Would we see the same miracle in our community that they saw in their day? What if we took the time? 100% of us. To share our faith in Jesus Christ with another human being, they came and made their own choice to be a follower. Would the Lord add to our number daily those who are being saved? That's the mission of our church. Love people to life by helping them find and follow Jesus. And if we do it all together in complete alignment, the miraculous can happen. God, we believe in miracles. We believe in your son. We thank you for what he did for us. We celebrated today that sacrifice. Father God, each and every one of us have things that we engage in for you, for your son, for our community to help people find and follow Jesus. And each and every one of us have a place that we can grow. So my prayer today, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit in the heart of every person here, that you would identify that one place that you would desire they might grow, whether it's in giving or serving or attending or studying or praying or worshiping, whichever it is, Lord, would you help us to take the next step in our spiritual journey and would you use us? to grow the kingdom, and our deepest prayer is that you would add to our number those who are being saved. Amen.